Welcome back here with Goldberg. Today we're going to be talking about public versus private insurance. Should the government be involved or not? This is a very contentious issue, obviously, the last 10 or 11 years in the United States. People have become tribalistic. So you either have to endorse their chosen model, or you're a horrible person who wants to see everyone die. And this is not a very helpful approach, because given the nature of healthcare, how people get sick, no matter which way we go, certain folks are going to be cut out of the system. Not everyone's going to be a winner, realistically. And that's something that doesn't work well for politics, but it is obviously important to consider. And that's what we're going to try to do in this video. Just to start, this is a good documentary from Frontline. Uh, he goes around the world looking at different healthcare systems. So they have the UK, which is completely government run, although I think the new labor and conservative governments have been trying to privatize it gradually. Um, and people tend to like the NHS, although there are criticisms about if you need very unique treatment like that baby a couple years ago, they wanted to come to the United States, and the government said, no, that's not to our fancy. So you can see how that can play out. Germany, the system worked pretty well but the doctor was complaining that her salary was kind of capped. And then, of course, in Taiwan, he said, no, we would not use the American private sector free market system at all. Now, of course, people will say we really don't have that. Uh, they'll point to Italy as government run. They had a bunch of deaths from coronavirus. But Italy is also a relatively small country with a very old population. Uh, China, I think China just puts people in ovens if they don't like them. I heard something about that. It might have been dead people they were putting in ovens, such I guess would be like a crematorium, but I wouldn't put it past communist China. And then actually India didn't have a terrible uh, rate of death, and I think that has a lot to do with their diet. Iran, on the other hand, has a mixture of private sector and government, and they had really high rates of uh, people dying from COVID, even senior officials and politicians. So it's going to be complicated whichever way you turn. Like I said, conservatives would tell you that we actually don't have uh, free market health care. We have socialism, Medicare, Medicaid, price controls. We have this other article from the same place, of course, and they say health care is neither a right or a privilege, it's a commodity. This reminds me of Stefan Molyneux when he was going, why should an insurance company insure you now that you're sick? You should have been smart and actually purchased care. Ahead of, t uh, ahead of time. So you can see how these debates become a question of the business side versus the ethical side, the human side. And it's not an easy one to solve, to be perfectly real. Uh, I do believe that the free market works really well for the stuff that's more predictable uh, when it comes to healthcare. We get into the specialized, it's a little bit more complicated. So if you look at other areas, a 10 or 11 year old kid, he's probably going to want the, uh, I don't know what it is now. It used to be Skylanders. Maybe now it's Fortnite or Minecraft for Christmas. You have a lot of competition across different races, classes for those sorts of products. A 15 or 16 year old girl might want the latest smartphone, even though smartphones are a little bit pricier. The fact that the good conservatives, libertarians, have sent jobs overseas, you can manufacture them cheaply. So as a consumer item, it's easier to provide that on a cheaper basis overall to make it affordable. And then if you have your local, let's say, PUAs, they might be interested in buying a dildo, so you can bring the price down in that way as well. The problem being, healthcare is not the same. If a kid gets cancer at the age of five, how do you predict that? If they get it at the age of 50, an adult, how do you predict that? If it needs very specialized treatment, technology that has certain patents on it, it's not that simple. Uh, we're always thinking of healthcare with a free market argument. We think of it in terms of like, you know, you go in there, it's like, um, Oh, mal di testa, doctore. Mal di testa, prende questo. And I've used Teladoc. They don't, they don't spend much time with you. They're basically like, okay, write a prescription. Um, that can work, but there are downsides to it. So, for instance, people were talking about this for Medicare for All and uh, the potential job losses, which can be as many as $2 million in the insurance industry if you went to Medicare for All. That is something that 
Um, one of the reasons I think we have not had significant health care reform is because there are so many jobs on the line. But that, by the way, is true of the so-called free market system as well. This is something they may not tell you. If we get to a model where you can just uh, you go into the doctor's office and you have a little self-serve kiosk, you swipe your card, you pay the doctor directly, that would eliminate a lot of expense because much of it is administrative. Uh, people deciding, you know, to copy your health insurance cards and send it to some particular company. But that also means the lady who's the medical billing specialist, the claim adjuster, the claim manager, positions like that might disappear because they wouldn't be necessary anymore. So people need to be honest, which whatever you're advocating, there is going to be a hemorrhage of jobs if you overhaul the U.S. healthcare system realistically. Jobs will be cost. Uh, it's just the name of the game. Going back to our main argument, as far as why expenses are kind of high, you've got how do you become a doctor, right? So if you could become a primary care doctor by taking like a year or two of apprenticeship and you just have to learn what wear a white coat and look in a little database of what this person is feeling and prescribe them something, yeah, the cost at least to primary care would go down the drain very quickly. But of course, all countries have this. It's a form of guild socialism. You have to take the MCAT. You have to do so much school. You have to do the residency, just like with law school. You have to take the LSAT, pass the bar exam. That's a way to protect salaries. It's a way to say not everyone can jump in here and then you can be undermined by cheap labor, even though obviously, oftentimes the professionals are the ones trying to undermine or cheap labor poor people, right? But that's what we've seen. They sent the good jobs overseas for working class people. Now they've been trying to bring in cheap labor to, uh, you know, take the underbelly out of the job market. It's harder to do that when it comes to a doctor, especially if it's a specialist position, because if you reduce the standards, okay, yeah, you might bring down costs, but you're also going to be doing it potentially at the expense of quality of care. And this is stuff that you can't just say, well, that's not relevant. It absolutely is. The other thing that we go back to the question of specific technologies or drugs, we have the Martin Shrekley argument. He's a rich dude. He's successful. Why shouldn't he be allowed to jack up the price, even if that could potentially cost someone their life if they can't afford it? There's the business side, the more libertarian argument. And then there's the, well, you know, that's not right. People shouldn't have to die or go bankrupt just to get medical care. And you can kind of see how this works because not every type of advanced treatment, chemotherapy, which some people would say you shouldn't even do chemotherapy because it's deadly. I tend to lean in that direction, but I'm not giving medical advice. Uh, you don't always have a generic. You don't always have some part of the market that's going to make it cheaper or as effective. If there's a very stringent patent on that particular um, you know, whatever technology or medicine, it may be more complicated than you think. Now we see this with you know, some of this basic stuff you can buy, like an Excedrin. You buy it at Walmart, it's usually four or five dollars. But if you were to go and get Equate, look at that. You've got, it's going to be like 94 cents for the same thing. If you could do that for everything in healthcare, yeah, technically it could work. But our company is going to be able to produce the same thing for, you know, cancer treatment, for diabetes? Are they going to be able to produce a knockoff? Are they going to be able to get around patents? And of course, some people would say, libertarian conservative, if you develop the technology, you should make as much money as you want off of it. It's not fair that someone comes in and steals your idea to do a generic. So these are very uh, complicated questions. I, I think if we were going to go in the direction before, you know, totally free market or Medicare for all, there is an important first step. That is this McCarran-Ferguson Act that was passed in 1945. It's discussed in Matt Tybee's book, which I will try to link to, and definitely worth checking out. But it, it partially exempts insurance companies from antitrust legislation applied to most business, allows states to regulate insurance, to establish licensing requirements, and preserve certain state laws of insurance. This is where you, they talk about the lines around the states. Uh, if certain insurance companies can do price gouging, can essentially 
form monopolies or cartels of sorts when it comes to the price of technology or care, that's going to drive up cost. Now, this is a big debate. Do we say, get rid of that? Or do we say, yeah, if you, you know, this, there's a views on both sides in libertarian and conservative communities. Some of them will say uh, monopolies are better. Who are you to come in as the government and violate the free market by saying, oh no, we have to maintain the free market through antitrust legislation? Other people say it's the only way you can keep that liberal market going. So I think that would be the first step. The reason it did not happen during the 09-2010 healthcare debates is because this guy, this guy, Ben Nelson, they needed his vote in the Senate. He just so happened to be a former CEO of an insurance company. So what do you think about that? Uh, that's why it's so hard to reform healthcare in a significant way. We go back to the jobs question, the insurance industry, people like this. The Senate is controlled by the insurance industry. So it gives you a sense of things. Now, what do I use currently? I have one of these. It's like a health sharing plan. Uh, and it works pretty well. I think I pay a little less than $200 a month and I get like a thousand dollar deductible. But there are cases such as this where what they do is because they're not officially insurance, they'll say we can deny certain things that are pre-existing. In this case, it was, I think, related to cancer treatment. And then they had to come back after appeal and they agreed to it. But you do have to go through more of that paperwork. Um, and they do have stipulations. So it's like, look, you can't be into drugs, you can't be doing, say, premarital sex, because many of them are faith-based, and that's how they justify it. We're not going to let everyone in. So would these work nationwide? It's hard to say. This might be the libertarian solution, but will they be able to cover everything? Will they cover pre-existing conditions? The likelihood is, no, not consistently at least. Uh, this is a really good book to check out. Because whether it's the government-run system, you end up with some degree of rationing based upon how much it's funded by the state. And then even the private sector system, realize you're going to end up subsidizing people regardless. And the reason is this. If you have, the, uh, if you have let's say, the, the private system and certain people can't pay unless you allow hospitals to deny them care, or if hospitals even agree to deny them care, which is not guaranteed, you're going to have a situation where if those people can't pay and they're on the poorer side and they just dump their bills on the system, your premiums are liable to go up, right? Yeah, you can say, well, if you don't have insurance, you can't pay. We're just going to, you know, we're going to try to pursue you financially. But if they just declare bankruptcy, who do you think is going to absorb the cost? If the government's not stepping in with a subsidy, it's going to be other people in the plan. Your rates are going to go up, your hospital stays are going to go up because they have to subsidize it somehow. So that's one problem. Um, and it becomes more complicated because, like he mentions here, if you have someone with a really unique rare condition where it's extremely costly to treat them, under the current system a lot of hospitals have their own little charity funds, so many millions of dollars for people who are in unique situations, but they also have to have that a viewpoint of rationing. So if you come in and it's like, well, this might work, they're probably going to die within six months, but at least we'll give them more a chance to live. But it's going to spunk our entire or spike our entire uh, relief fund. Do you allow the person to have that even though it can come at the expense of other people? In the government system, same thing. Do you provide more expensive experimental treatment even though you don't really have funding for it? You're probably going to end up just making them comfortable and letting them pass on. So it's a very tough decision. It's not like, oh yeah, we'll just you find the cheaper model somewhere else. And that's the sad truth. Um, with all that being said, and I think that regardless of the way we approach healthcare, we have to look at prevention. Everyone has this reactionary way, oh, let's pass this legislation. But the voluntary stuff, but it's not even necessarily voluntary because, and we're going to see right here, some of our health outcomes, obesity, projected obesity, heart disease, diabetes, 41% uh, projected to get cancer in their lifetime. A lot of that, I suspect, is because of the chemicals we're around, but it's also because of what we're eating. And if you look at the EU, the EU has much better food safety laws, food preparation laws. 
which might explain why in some cases with government-run health care they don't have as many problems. Uh, it doesn't mean that they could not have those, but what you eat actually matters. So look at this stuff. Mountain Dew that has like a flame retardant ingredient in it. That's allowed in the United States. It's not allowed in other countries. Milk with RBST, mac and cheese, packaged ground beef, um, certain types of chicken, pork, bread. And we don't really, we're not mindful of that. The stuff that you're consuming, especially we talk about those poor folks who might not be able to afford healthcare, might dump their bills on the system, they're tending to eat garbage. This is where I said, and I brought this up in my book, I think I brought up in the book on centrism, you can check out if you're interested, but it's like, if you don't regulate the health insurance, you want that to be a free market, and you don't regulate what people are eating, like the ingredients that go in, at a certain point, something's got to give. Because if you have a free market system, but people are eating garbage, most of them are not aware, the best way to solve that is to say, these are the standards of what has to go into food. People might still not eat great, but at least they're not going to be eating all this stuff that is going to actually been linked to cancers and other things. If you don't do that, you're probably going to have a bankrupt system, whether it's government run or it's private sector, because you cannot really afford to essentially accommodate people who you already know have certain outcomes and just say, well, it should be voluntary. That sounds great. But if they're not doing it voluntarily, like I said, the system is not going to be sustainable. Now, I guess you could say with a free market, well, deny people care, just let them die if they can't pay for it. Um, will people do that? Will that actually work long term? Like I said, if hospitals go with, no, we're going to accept them anyway, those bills are going to be dumped on someone, probably dumped on the consumer. Ultimately, it'll find its way through the system. If you treat illegal aliens and they don't pay, same thing. So, like I said, very complicated issues. We need to be looking at the preventative side to avoid people getting sick, and that will bring down the cost, whether it's a free market system or it's a government-run system. So, um, if you have any questions, drop them below, and let me know other videos you want to see done in the future.